So something simple that we can do that um, we can do very easily, because most patients will have something like this, is ask for a clear glass, right? And what you do is you ask them to push it up against the rash, and because it's a clear glass, you can see if it blanches or not. Hello, welcome. In today's video, we're going to be talking all about telemedicine, and I'm joined by a special guest. Hi everyone, my name is Hina Mazarudin. I am the Vice President for PAs in Virtual Medicine and Telemedicine, and I'm excited to be here today. We're excited to have you to learn Thank about you. this topic that seems so <laughs> nebulous and confusing to me, especially with COVID. Uh, telemedicine is becoming more and more common, and uh, some people had it thrust upon them, some people chose to, to go that route, um, but I think that there's just a lot of, of questions in, in general. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Um, are you practicing as a PA as well as involved in this organization, those kind of things? Sure, so um, I do practice as a telemedicine PA. My full-time practice, I practice obesity medicine, um, and then my part-time job is I practice in a virtual urgent care. So two kind of different areas, but both of them utilize telemedicine. What do you think are the best parts about telemedicine? Why, why do you think that people should consider working in telemedicine? Telemedicine obviously is a way for us to connect with our patients. At the end of the day, telemedicine is a platform. That's all it is. And it allows us to have that connectivity. We're no longer limited to zip codes. We can meet our patients where they're at, whether it's at their home, their office, wherever it is. Um, so we have that ability to connect and intervene or help or whatever needs to happen um, at that point, at a sooner point than perhaps later. Right. So that's one kind of benefit of that. Um, so as far as my obesity medicine practice, um, telemedicine has actually been really helpful because I've been able to um, really decrease our no-show rates, right? right? So you imagine on a typical day, we have of course a full panel, inevitably there's going to be a no-show or a cancellation right. just because life happens. But usually I can convert that over um, into a telemedicine visit because it's very easy to be like, okay, can I just quickly connect with you? It doesn't matter if you're at home, whatever it is. Right. And usually most people are able to accommodate that and we're able to still have that continuity of care. Yeah. Um, and then from a business standpoint, it ends up being beneficial as well because then we're still capturing that visit. Right. Other than being beneficial for the patients and cutting down on no-shows and bringing in more revenue, just personally as a provider, mm -hmm. Are there some, some things that you didn't expect to really like about telemedicine that you do or anything that surprised you about it? Yeah, for me, what I really enjoy about telemedicine is it allows me to think outside the box um, because and it really forces me to understand what I'm asking for, why I'm asking for it, and how it affects my clinical decision making. Um, so I feel like that's really kind of helped me become more intentional as a, as a provider yeah. to ask for like, okay, what am I looking for and why is this important to me? And then also gives me the opportunity to think about how do I obtain that information in a different way. Right. So I can give you an example if you want to see one, because um, I figured you were going to ask me for this. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this one I showed to the students also. Um, so I'll give you this demo. So let's say we're seeing a patient who has a rash. Right, so very common, especially in an urgent care setting, that this is what I'm gonna see. All right, so this is a rash, right? And we're gonna pretend this is one, rather. And what I wanna know is, is the rash blanchable or not, right? That's important to my medical decision-making on what I'm gonna do. So I can either, normally in the clinic, we would you know, go up there and touch the patient's skin, find out what's going on, or on a telemedicine visit, I could ask them, hey, can you press on it and tell me, does it blanch or what's going on with that way? But sometimes that can be a little bit hard to gather that information. And then also it becomes a subjective finding because I'm relying on the patient oh, to give okay. me their interpretation of that versus an objective finding. So something simple that we can do that um, we can do very easily because most patients will have something like this is ask for a clear glass, right? And what you do is you ask them to push it up against the rash. And because it's a clear glass, you can see if it blanches or not. Oh yeah, so that's actually a, um, technique that's used for meningitis rash. That's actually what it's meant for. It's called oh. the tumbler test. Um, but you can use it for any rash because you're just right. trying to you know, gather that information. Yeah. But it, like I said, makes me realize what am I asking for? Why is it important? And then how do I gather that information utilizing what the patient has at home? Right. What are the challenges that you've come across? So technology can be a blessing or it can be a challenge, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> especially when it doesn't work the way you want it to. Um, so that's often on my day-to-day, -day, probably the most challenging, right? Is like getting the technology to work to make it smooth. What I would say is our biggest challenge is those legislative, what I call shackles, because we're not able to you know, get the things that we're looking for to have that um, ability to, to see more patients, to, to connect with them, to get that information we may need. Like doctors and nurses, for example, have an ability to have a compact license. 
and that is where you have the ability to hold multiple uh, state licensures. Yeah. Yeah. Versus a PA, one of the challenges that we have is we have to apply to each state and get a licensure that way. Um, so it slows down the process, it makes it a lot more challenging to get that. So we have you know, some legislative barriers as far as what we're able to do. The way the state licenses work in telemedicine is that you have to be licensed in the, the state where the patient yes. lives, is that Absolutely. how it works? Yeah, you must be licensed in the state where the patient is located. Okay. So not necessarily even lives, it's where they're located. So okay. they could be potentially living like for example in Texas, right? Yeah. But if they travel to Oklahoma, right, <laughs> right, not terribly too far from us, right. um, but once they've crossed state borders, unless oh, I hold okay. a, a Oklahoma license, I technically can't see them. Yeah. But that's something though that I, I know people are working on, right? They're trying to get the legislative changes to allow us to have those compacts for licenses, Absolutely. which would be so nice because working locums, that's a challenge I have as well. It's mm -hmm. like you have to be licensed in each state that you want to, to work in. Exactly. Unless it's a federal facility. <laughs> So exactly. Does, does, that, does that the same for telemedicine? Right. Okay, so federal facilities or anything that you're doing for a federal organization, you don't have to worry about state license. They if have you're doing a little bit, yeah. They have a little bit of a different structure. Yeah. So I assume that there's some specialties that are easier than others to do telemedicine in. You sure. know, I know psych, I've always heard that, that psych is, because you're basically just talking, there's not a whole lot of physical exam normally um, in that. But what other specialties lend themselves well to telemedicine, do you think? Sure, so almost any specialty can utilize telemedicine. And I say telemedicine as a broad term because most people think of telemedicine as a two-way live audiovisual synchronous connection, right? So like essentially a HIPAA compliant Zoom call, <laughs> right? Um, but there are actually other types of telemedicine also. So you have asynchronous, think of like, for example, apps nowadays that you see. Um, there's interprofessional consults, there's the use of remote patient monitoring, artificial intelligence. So there are quite a few other things that fall under that, that scope um, that you can still utilize, which allows you to have that ability to see, see almost any specialty can utilize some aspect of it. Um, but even within each specialty, I have seen um, them use it's remarkable what they're able to do. Um, in fact, on our PA VMT website, we actually do an interview series where we talk to different um, PAs, real PAs who are utilizing telemedicine in their respective specialties. Oh. Um, so we've interviewed cardiology, pediatrics, we've done ICU. So there's a lot of different kind of um, uses to it, addiction medicine, where it's a little opposite of what you think because the patient actually comes into the clinic, but the provider is the one who is not there. <laughs> and she is the one who's providing the telemedicine from you know everywhere else. So when, like the jobs that you work in with telemedicine, so is it 100% telemedicine or do you ever go into the, the clinic? So um, I have two jobs. One is I do obesity medicine mm -hmm. and that is more of we utilize telemedicine as a hybrid tool. So I'm in the clinic like normal. I have patients who come in like normal, right. but then we also have a telemedicine component that we can utilize to, to connect with them. Um, so that is, one aspect of what I do. The other thing of what I do is I work in a virtual urgent care. Um, so that is a little bit different, the setup, because it's actually a kiosk that is located inside of a grocery store. Oh. <laughs> so the patient walks in, there is a medical assistant there. Um, the medical assistant gets the patient set up and then calls me. I get onto a platform similar to this and together we take care of our patient. But the MA serves as my hands to get everything done um, and then but the unique thing of that is that I have access to all my regular tools. So things like your otoscope, ophthalmoscope, stethoscope, except all of my tools now have a camera attached to them. Okay. So I can look inside ears, nose, and throat and listen to heart and lungs. I have access to an EKG, labs, mm -hmm. things like that. So therefore my scope becomes a little bit more, right? right. Because I have the ability to right. do that. So it's, it's variable. <laughs> I see a lot of ads for you know, work in telemedicine. Are there companies like that that are popping up that are, that are getting all of that technology in place and you just, come in as a provider? To, you can, to, yeah. Absolutely, the one I started with was a startup company. So of course that requires growing pains. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was not like day one you walk in and everything's ready to go. Right. Um, but that itself ended up being a blessing because that's how I was able to get on the management side. So what other kind of conditions are you seeing in that virtual urgent care uh, situation? Sure, so it's very similar to the conditions you would see in a regular urgent care, right? So a majority, especially right now, it's obviously COVID um, symptoms and screening. But um, before that, I would say a lot of ear infections, cough, cold, um, strep throat, UTI, rashes, you know, your basic kind of things that you would see in an urgent care for the most part. Um, it was created to have kind of as a middle between um, telemedicine traditional where you're at home 
um, and versus having going to the ER. And if somebody's coming in with chest pain, you know, if I'm traditionally seeing you at home and you tell me you have chest pain, yeah. eh, you know, <laughs> that makes me nervous. Right. <laughs> but if you come into a virtual urgent care where I have the ability to do an EKG and kind of get an idea, do some right. labs, you know, then it gives me a little bit more reassurance. It doesn't mean that I still won't triage out to higher level care if needed. There's a lot on the horizon about wearable devices. Absolutely. Do you see that being like a a huge change in telemedicine is that AI or those devices come on board? Yeah. Absolutely. Wearables are definitely getting integrated, are here to stay, are <laughs> going to be seeing a lot more as you keep moving okay. forward um, on this. Um, but even like you mentioned about if somebody's at home, how do you obtain vitals? You can always ask the patient. A lot of patients will already have some basic things at home. Most people have a thermometer. Yeah. Most people, if they have a history of blood pressure, may even have a blood pressure cuff at home. Nowadays, because of COVID, most people also have, this, have a pulse ox that they have. Right. <laughs> um, and so we can still utilize these tools and ask the patient, hey, can you do that? Um, for obesity medicine, obviously I need to know their weight, so I need right. you to step on a scale. Um, there are remote uh, patient monitoring devices and kits that we can also send out and oh. utilize. You can use different tools um, in this remote patient monitoring kit that will constantly be feeding back information so we can see trends and see how things are going and intervene appropriately. Right. But if they don't have any of that, um, at basic, you can always assess, first of all, how are they looking, right? Uh, do they look sick? Do they not? What is, what's going on? Um, you can always have, at minimum, the patient respiration count because you can always observe that. Right. You can, at minimum, usually also get a pulse. You can literally show them, hey, I need you to find your pulse and then count it out loud or find it on your neck, whatever it is. That's another way to get that. Um, you know, so there's basic kind of things that you can get right. at a very, very rudimentary level. But most people, like I said, will typically have, a, a, at minimum, a thermometer at home. Right. Yeah. I, guess I didn't think about that. I, 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 when I think about it, it's not, um, it's not official. Right. <laughs> it's like, it's what you start thinking about. But if you're... Have a, they put a digital thermometer in their mouth and then they pull it out and you can see the numbers. Exactly. I mean, and that's and that's considered objective again, right? Absolutely. You, so yeah, that's saying. a great point. That's, that is what I literally tell them. Can you show me on the screen? Yeah. You know, so that way I can see it and I can objectively say, you know, yeah. 97.6 or whatever. They're... Do you feel like you're open to lawsuits more since you're not seeing the patient in person and doing some of the tests you might do? I think many people have that misconception. Um, so at the end of the day, telemedicine is a platform. That's all right. it is, right? Um, the, your medical standard still stays the same. The medicine doesn't change. Right. It's just your way of how you're connecting. Now, there are some limitations, and there are times where you're going to have to refer out, or it's out of the scope, or it's not appropriate. Right. So with that being said, um, but technically, there shouldn't be a higher liability with it. Um, there have been some research papers that have been published that are showing that there is not um, okay. a higher chance of, you know, uh, bad things happening, right. <laughs> bad outcomes. Um, um, now, granted, these are small, you know, studies that have been done. There have not been large scale. It'll be interesting to see after this pandemic because they'll do a lot more, right. you know, retrospective yeah. analysis. Um, but even um, with PAVMT, we actually have partnered with a um, a insurance company that does malpractice for PAs, um, and we were able to, you know, work with them. And it's the same same rate. It's not actually a higher oh, okay. risk. Um, that was going to be another question. Is like, do do you have to get certain riders or anything specific on your malpractice, or is it just the standard malpractice that we all carry? It should technically fall under the stand the standard malpractice, mm -hmm. assuming you're doing the same thing, right? Right. Now, if you are doing something that's high risk that is outside of your scope, well, then that's right. a whole other ballgame. <laughs> and just to be clear, you're not. A, a malpractice attorney I am or not. insurance agent or anything like that. <laughs> Let me so. be very clear. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, everyone needs to do their own due diligence and, yes. and check. But in general, they shouldn't have to have special um, insurance. I guess when you're when you're practicing telemedicine, um, it's, it's just similar as if you are working in a, a clinic where you're the only provider in the clinic. Um, if you have if you need to ask somebody else a question or a supervising physician, you just Put those people on hold and, and go off somewhere else and call the call somebody is that how it works sure yeah. again depends on each setup the way it the way it's done in my obesity medicine practice yes it's literally like that i'd be like one second i need to go <laughs> make a quick phone call or, or you know right. walk next door and ask um that kind of a thing um but in my virtual urgent care there's usually multiple providers on at the same time so we have an internal chat oh. that we can kind of you know speak and connect with and kind of ask Ask a friend, ask yeah. a colleague. Um, of <laughs> phone course, a friend. <laughs> phone a friend, exactly. Or chat a friend. 
I mean, obviously as PAs, because we have that relationship with our collaborating physicians, right. they are always available. So you can always pick up the phone or con you know contact them however you need to. So I guess the other question I have is about about billing and and and, and I, I don't know how much you can speak to this, but in general, the pay that we get reimbursed for seeing somebody, you know, telemedicine versus in person, I, I know right now it's probably a little skewed because of COVID, mm -hmm. but in, in general, is it is it the same? Is there like a percentage less that we get paid? How does that work? Sure, so in fact, it was kind of the opposite, whereas before it used to be skewed and we were not getting that payment parity or getting okay. paid, reimbursed the same amount. Um, but now the pandemic has kind of helped <laughs> in that aspect where we are able to build and get that, that payment parity. So you're getting paid, reimbursed the same amount as if you were um, seeing the patient in clinic. Um, again, depends on what type of telemedicine, because like I said, there are different types as far as what the reimbursements are. And a lot of them are time dependent, which is a little bit different than the way that we typically most commonly see like in an outpatient setting, it's usually more complexity based. You can do it complexity based, but it's more easier to do it time based. Right. Um, so that's maybe a little bit of a difference. When you bill it, you use the same e &M coding that you would. I'm speaking of outpatient settings. And then um, the only difference or as far as when you're looking at billing is I have to add a modifier to let okay. the biller know that this was a telemedicine visit. Is there indication that that's going to go back to like it was before? Um, do you have any idea? I mean, no, you don't know the answer because yeah. no one knows. No one knows the answer with COVID right now. Everything's up in the air. But um, does it? Any, are there any indications that 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 is here to stay? I sure hope it is. Yeah. Um, the public health emergency, um, I guess, has been officially extended right now until the next year, right? Uh -huh. So it's still going into 2022. Um, and then every 90 days, I think, is when they kind of reevaluate and oh, okay. see what the next um, extension is going to be. Um, so until right now under that umbrella, it is still getting that payment parity. Before we had COVID and before that, there were actually restrictions. So you had to have, it had to be in a federally underserved area. Oh, there was okay. something known as an originating site and a distant site. It's where the patient and the provider is. They had to be approved areas. Um, it was not as widespread or as easily accessible as it is now, which is what most people think of like where the patient is at home, you know, that kind right. of thing. Yeah. Um, you had to have an approved area where that would allow that for reimbursement. So because obviously of the pandemic, that had to be changed and had to be accommodated where the patient right. could be at home. And so that ended up helping us. <laughs> right. Do all of the insurances cover telemedicine now and Medicare? So it's hard to say what if all insurances do. Um, I can speak on Medicare, or so CMS, which is Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they are the ones that pretty much set the standard. So um, whenever there is an extension or, or anything happening, when it comes from the top federal <laughs> level up there, all eyes go to them. Right. Um, because what they set is usually what the other private payers are going to typically mimic and follow. Um, so within each one, of course, Blue Cross Blue Shield, United Healthcare, Aetna, Cigna, all these other private ones have their own little nuances, but if you, watch what CMS does, that's usually going to give you the idea of what the others are going to follow suit as. Are there any other laws like state laws or regulations um, that people have to be aware of with telemedicine or is it pretty much just whatever the insurance will reimburse? So absolutely state law is super important. They are the ones who <laughs> set the tone and set <laughs> dictate what you are able to do and not able to do um, because each state is the one that runs you know, they have, yeah. they have um, authority over their, their own state as what they'll allow and not allow. Okay. Um, so jurisprudence on that. Um, so it is very important to know what your state, <laughs> <laughs> what your state allows. Please always look at that because what they do in Texas, for example, is different than what they do in California or New York or whatever it is. Right. Um, so as long as you know that, but then reimbursement, same thing. They're gonna look at um, each. So Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas may be different than Blue Cross Blue Shield okay. of California. Yeah. And I think that I, on the PAVMT site, they there is some guidance for the different states, right? The state right. laws. Yeah. So yeah. absolutely, we try to maintain a matrix for that, so that people, our providers, can yeah. log on and get access to that. And, and what's that website again? Sure, it's www.pavmt.org. Okay. Pretty simple. I'll put a link uh, for that <laughs> below in the description. So if people are are interested in in telemedicine, um, how do you suggest that they go about finding the opportunities or learning more about it? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say 
to learn more about, I mean, obviously I have to put a plug in for PA no, DMT. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> come to the website. <laughs> um, no, but really, do, do come visit us at our website. Um, and the reason I say that is because we even do, like I mentioned, um, we have a series where we interview real PAs that are utilizing telemedicine in their respective fields. So it'll give you an idea and exposure of how this is really being done. Okay. And that's something that I think that makes us a little bit unique is because we are provider strong. I mean, we are literally, the strength comes from our providers and what they are able to incorporate and able to do. Um, and so sometimes it's nice to have somebody in that same area of practice that you can always just watch and be like, okay, this is what they're doing and then gives you an idea of how you want right. to integrate into your own. That's probably the easiest way to get into telemedicine, especially if you're already a practicing provider. Um, because if you can bring it to your own already established practice, then that's a little bit easier than necessarily right. breaking into another, you know, leaving this job starting off or whatever it is. I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just saying that it's a little bit more of a challenge. Um, of course, we do have our own jobs website, so you can always keep a lookout for that. I think I also saw that there were some things to help you learn about physical exam in telemedicine. Did I, yeah, is that correct? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yes. So um, going back to our PAVMT site real quick, we have four pillars, um, which are legislation, advocacy, education, and employment. And so we believe success in the first three is what leads to those employment opportunities. So my role particularly with PAVMT is I lead our education pillar. So my focus is more on towards um, creating curriculum that gets integrated into PA education. Um, so that way our PA students are aware of telemedicine and they learn about it during their PA school training days um, so that they will be successful when they graduate. So that's kind of more of the focus on, on what I lead as far as our education okay. pillar. But we also do, of course, we, we're uh, creating monthly webinars for our providers and our, it's focused towards our PA students, but our providers can join okay. as well um, so that they can learn about what is telemedicine, the different types of telemedicine. Um, this past year, we did each month a different specialty. So we oh, did okay. uh, cardiology, pediatrics, psychiatry, urgent care, family practice. I mean, we kind of went down the whole neurology. Right. Um, so that's one of our free services that we um, do monthly and then, or we did this past year monthly, and then to access those replays, um, if you become a member, you'll be able to see all of those okay. recordings as well. In the settings that you work in, how much time do you get to spend with each patient? Sure, so in my obesity medicine practice, it's very similar to if you came in the clinic. So roughly every 15, 20 minutes, right, is what our um, scheduling slots look like. Um, so it follows the same thing because I literally move one slot and it will just say telemedicine with the patient's name. Um, so it's not a separate thing altogether. Okay. Um, with the virtual urgent care, again, kind of like an urgent care, right? It depends on the complexity of what's coming in. If it's something very straightforward, then you can usually get them in and out fairly quickly. If it's something that requires a lot more history taking or they have a complex background or what's going on, it, it's very dependent on that. Um, I shared with you earlier the diabetic screening. That visit from start to finish can happen in 15 minutes because it goes very quickly. There's a machine, you just <laughs> follow it and go from there. Um, versus somebody who's coming in for a sick visit, depending on what it is, can take a little bit longer. Anything else besides the visit and the charting, mm -hmm. which you can never escape charting. Charting is paperwork. Charting. <laughs> <laughs> never uh, leaves. Is there anything else um, administrative wise that people don't think about? So your documentation changes a little bit because there's certain things that they want documented oh, okay. um, when you're doing a telemedicine visit versus not or vice versa, depending also on your um, insurance. Uh, Blue Cross has certain you know criteria that they want versus Cigna, Aetna, whatever. See, like, how do you know about all that stuff? I mean, what, <laughs> is that just... You learn uh, on the job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you learn on the job. Yeah, there's not... Um, I mean, you can definitely read. You can go to each one and read and see what, you know, when you get okay. credentialed. Um, so the clinic that I work for, like my obesity medicine, there, we have a credentialing team, a billing okay. credentialing team, right? So they do all of that for me, like on my behalf. Okay. Um, but then at the same time, we collaborate together. So the office manager and I are constantly looking at, okay, what's going on? Am okay. I doing it correctly? What are we doing? What is our reimbursement looking like? Um, so we monitor those those numbers to see kind of where we can right. get better at. See, it sounds like a nightmare to me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, is a it is definitely a learning curve. It is not something I thought I would ever go into. The technology aspect of mm -hmm. it, um, I assume that there are certain platforms that are HIPAA approved and other ones that Absolutely. aren't. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what do you, what typically do people use? Are there a lot of different options? There are many different options out there now. A lot of them that are even integrated in your own EMR. So like your oh, okay. big EMR ones, like your Epic, your, you oh, know, okay. all those, they, they typically have their own. Um, Cerna, all these big ones, um, they typically have their own. 
Um, but there are other ones. Um, Doxy is one. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones. Zoom actually even has a HIPAA compliant version. Okay. You have to sign a business contract to get that. Um, it's not your free version. <laughs> um, but yes, there are even regular platforms like that have the ability to do that. Like I could just imagine some of the patients that I've I've dealt with before. I mean, I know my struggles with technology, I, and I all just of us. think yeah. <laughs> all of us. I just wonder how how much does that come into play every day when you're when you're doing this. Obviously, there are technology challenges that happen. You know, sometimes it just doesn't connect. They can't get it to you know they can't angle it correctly. You don't know what you're looking at. The camera's backwards. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that can happen. Um, but a lot of these platforms are very user friendly and don't underestimate your patient. A lot of times people think, especially our um, older population right. may struggle more. And I don't find that to actually be true oh, okay. because it's a lot of times these are so straightforward and so easy. If you can FaceTime with somebody, if you can you know, right. basically do Skype, whatever, um, then you can pretty much do these because they're meant to be very user friendly. Um, where it's literally, it'll be a link, you click it, and that's it, and it'll pop okay. up, it'll do everything for you. Some of them are a little bit more complicated, but I mean, I've seen them as straightforward and as easy as that. It can be a really great thing for patients because I know, especially patients that have mobility issues yeah. or transportation issues yeah. and those things, it can be difficult yes. uh, for them to, to get out. You know, Or if somebody's just not feeling well, who wants to come to an office and sit exactly. there when exactly. they feel like crap to be told to go home and rest. <laughs> right, or, yeah. or even if you think about logistics, right? Even if it's for a follow-up visit or whatever it is, right? Let's say you have somebody, for example, um, a parent, a single parent who has to take off of work, mm -hmm. find um, you know, childcare or whatever it is, come, park, pay the fees, and then come in, see the doctor for what could be, or a PA or nurse practitioner, or whatever, um, for what is maybe five, 10, 15 minute visit. Right. That really didn't require that much you know, right. more. Yeah. And it's like the amount of time, energy, money, frustration, everything that goes into that, if you can avoid that by yeah. just you know meeting the patient where they are, right? So if they're, they can just do a phone visit, especially yeah. like our wound checks. So a lot of times in surgery, mm -hmm. you'll see that happen yeah. um, where providers where assuming everything is fine, you know, like it's a wound check. It's not that long. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So it, yeah. you just come is in. Is pus coming out of it? Yeah. Is, is it red, red oozy, draining? draining? Like, what does it look like? <laughs> Do you have a fever? No, you're good. <laughs> exactly. And even from a billing perspective, right, those are technically global visits, right? So you, right. Don't, you don't get, get paid for those. Right. The, those are part of the, the original, the package <laughs> that you right. paid for initially. Um, so even if you're able to say, let's say you did a procedure and you want to do a wound check, because that is what's the right thing to do and right. to take care of your patient, absolutely. Um, but if you can now allot that into a telemedicine visit and leave your slots open for patients who really either need to come in or potentially even need to be you know, setting up their initial to have the surgery, right. now that opens up a lot more access too. I know I've seen on forums in different places that, that some providers are starting to look at owning their own telemedicine mm -hmm. businesses. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? PAVMT, we actually do an entrepreneurship series. Oh, okay. So we do talk about that. And there are many pr um, providers um, nationwide who have started up their own business. Now, of course, each state you know, regulates what okay. is allowed, what is not, how much percentage you can own, how much you can't, you know, all that stuff comes into, so that's state dependent. Okay. But there are many providers, especially now with, um, when the pandemic happened, who realized, no, you know what, I really want to open up my own practice. But I think it okay. definitely gives you the option to have more control, to have more say of what you want to do, whether it's your hours, whether it's what you're actually spending your time doing, whether it is um, having more business say, having maybe better, um, reimbursements, knowing knowing really what your value is and what you're able to bring right. to the table or to your business and reaping the rewards without it being diluted necessarily in a other right. setting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Hina, for joining us today, for telling us about telemedicine, clearing up some of those um, questions that have been floating around in my head for a long time. I appreciate everyone joining me today. As always, if you've enjoyed this content, please hit the like button and also subscribe to the channel. It really does help me out. Uh, it helps it grow, helps me to bring you more content. If there's something that you want to see, something you're interested in knowing about, put that in the comments below. Let me know what you'd like to see and I'll do my best to get a video for you. Take care out there, stay sane, and I'll see you next time on The Medicine Couch. Bye. Hi everyone.